Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me and the fabulous Christopher, because I love recording Chris and it's really good fun and he's awesome. But Chris is going to tell us who we got on. Chris, who have we got on today? So today we have um, Annette Kane, who is a celebrated watercolorist who has exhibited and been on cha- appeared on Channel 4 and also co-wrote the book Being Bold with Watercolour. But she's here today to talk to us about her, her historical fiction book, Dolly Butler's Eight Day Week. Uh, Annette, welcome to History Hack. How are you doing? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's going to be fun. We're going to look at some non- non-fiction. My God, I can't even get on it today. We're going to look at a bit of fiction today, a little bit of history today. We have a bit of fun. Let's kick off with the first question. So when we talk about the suffragettes and the struggle for votes for women, there's also an aspect that not many people would really think of. What was going on between them and the bird conservationists? Well, could you mind if I just backtrack a little, just to tell you the background of, of course. How, how the book came about? Because then, then the the answer to that will become more um, meaningful. That's uh, fine. Yeah, no basically, worries. I was I was um, casting about for a an idea for my MA script writing final submission. And I read um, Susanna Stapleton's Adventures of Maud West about um, a female detective of the 20th century. And she just blew me away. I mean, what, it was a great book. I really recommend it. It's by Susanna Stapleton. And um, this, the, the Maud West was just such a wacky character. Now, my, my dolly isn't like Maud, but she gave me the idea. And so that was the idea for the character, but the idea from the plot came from Tessa Bose's Mrs. Pankhurst's Purple Feather, which is about the conflict. It's a non-fiction book. Um, it's about the conflict between the bird conservationists and the suffragettes. So that that's just the background of where I was starting from, because I'm not an historian. I got massively interested in it from just from reading these books. And of course, the more you delve, the more interesting it becomes. Um, so going back to your quite original question, what was going on between the suffragettes and the bird conservationists? What was happening was the suffragettes and suffragists were routinely vilified for being unattractive, overly masculine, unable to get husbands. So Emmeline Pankhurst's directive was to for 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 their for the suffragettes to dress. In a, in a feminine way, in a, an acceptable way, in a fashionable way. And that included those big feathered hats. So um, if you picture a, a suffragette, it's, it is occasionally with those big feathery hats that they wore. So basically, the, um, and the feather industry was massive. Feathers were imported by the tonne. And it was causing many bird species were threatened with extinction. So there was um, there was a a society called the British Ornithologist Union and they weren't doing anything. It was male only. They weren't they weren't doing anything. So Emily Williamson and Etta Lemon, which is a great name, started the Society of Protection of Birds. And that was in 1889. Uh, And it got its Royal Charter at the beginning of the next century at which time women weren't allowed to be on the committee anymore. So that, but that's beside the point. Um, so they set it up to, to be a bit more proactive about the, um, uh, about challenging the use of feathers on hats in order to protect the birds. So those two campaigns were running side by side, one for animal rights, one for women's rights. And of course, one of the objectives was to, stem the demand for feathers 
So they wanted the suffragettes in particular as, as sort of very visible representations of women um, to stop wearing feathered hats. But the suffragettes, that was so not their priority that they, they carried on wearing feathered hats. So those two campaigns were running side by side and they were both sort of addressed properly and finally in 1921. So that's that the idea of that conflict I thought was really interesting to use in a fictional way. So I do have Etta Lemon. Etta Lemon does appear in my book briefly and um, but it's just quite a significant character. And she sends Dolly into the factory, the feather workshops of the East End to investigate what's going on there. So also looking at the, the, the conditions that the women were working in, um, illegal trade of feathers, all that sort of thing. So that's a, that was the starting point for the plot. I'm sorry, got to do a brief side question. Was there, that sounds really silly, but was there really a major problem with uh, illegal feather trade? Because it, I know with like ivory, where they've tried, where they banned the legal trade of that, it's quite obviously still ongoing and bad, but I would never have put an illegal feather trade. Um, I've, I've kind of exaggerated that um, in that there was a duty, duty was only levied uh, at the time of, I've, I've set my, plot on imports of luxury goods so feathers were charged at a levy on import of 10 percent. so not a massive uh, levy there wasn't like tea of you know earlier and all that sort of very high excessive um, levies on imports um, so I kind of tweak that a bit just to add another dimension to the to the whole idea I mean I think there's a an illegal trade in, in in things like cigarettes and um, all sorts of things. So I think I think yes, but it wasn't it wasn't a particularly big problem. Yeah. So uh, my my granddad was a policeman, and so he's basically he said, well, if ever there's a chance for something to you can get something cheaper, there's going to be someone nicking it and having an illegal trade in it. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it was complicated further by the way that the feathers were harvested, and um, that was often done in a sort of underhand way and it wasn't regulated so there were lots of different aspects of the industry that that that, that I've kind of used. One of the other things he told me about was that obviously homosexuality was illegal at this time and even he was a policeman in the 50s and 60s and he's told me things that we'd consider exceptionally un-PC these days I can't believe they did what they did but were were lesbians similarly pros prosecuted by the state as homosexuals were well no and I'm sure most people will um will know that it was never illegal to be a lesbian or to, um, to, to carry on any sorts of lesbian practices because people didn't think it existed. Um, it's a bit of a myth about the Queen Victoria thing, th thinking it wasn't possible. But basically, um, I mean, I, I have to say I'm not an expert in this field and I can only say what I glean from researching it. But basically, um, up, up until the turn of the century, romantic friendships between women were accepted and really regarded as harmless and about kissing and cuddling at the most. So they didn't think there was anything to legislate against. But what happened was by the, 19, by the 1900s, it was the age of the new woman, and some lesbians didn't want to be seen anymore as sexless. Um, and one way to demonstrate this was to dress in masculine styles as well. So, so sort of the original butch femme model which isn't, you know, isn't relevant particularly today. So they started to draw attention to themselves. And what happened was, was that once um, people in power realised that what was going on, that they were, they were having some sorts of sexual relations, they wanted to stop it. And, and um, in 1921, the M MPs introduced and debated a clause added to the Criminal Amendment Act to outlaw acts of indecency by females. And um, it was actually thrown out by the Lords as they thought it would put the idea into too many women's heads. And the more that you advertise advice by prohibiting it, the more it'll increase. 
which is really funny, I think, you know, it's just the, the fact that women didn't even know it was going on, you know, and, and it was so patronising um, to think that they couldn't think of it themselves. And once they heard of it, well, they'd have a go at it. Yes. And the, it was a real, they saw that as a real threat. So, so no, homosexuality wasn't persecuted, between women was not persecuted in the same way at all until they drew attention to themselves. So, so yeah. So, so the, other, the other thing that, 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 um, that I sort of kind of came across as well was that when it was debated in the Lords, the Lord Chancellor, um, first Earl of Birkenhead said, the overwhelming majority of women of this country have never heard of this thing at all. And that I thought that was really funny as well, because I kind of had an instinctive feel for this when I was writing the book that different classes didn't know what other classes knew. Do you know what I mean? It was really sort of because people didn't talk about these things. Um, they assumed that other classes didn't know what was going on. So I'm, I'm, can I just read you a little bit from the book? that yes. illustrates this. Go for it. So this was written in the voice of um, one of the characters who's a lower class girl. And this is her perception of her boss, Dolly. My stomach flipped at the thought of having to tell Miss Butler about it, especially as she was not married. She was experienced at detecting, etc. but a single lady of her class would have no experience of other things. People like me have the information thrust upon them, whether they want it or not. So she 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 thinks that Dolly, being a middle class, well heeled sort of well educated woman, wouldn't know about anything any sexual matters. So um, that and, and that I kind of got a feel for before I actually discovered the fact that people didn't seem to know what other people knew. It was very very sort of um, strange times, really. There was, that, there was that kind of thick class lines, wasn't there? The, yes. The, the, no mingling between the two. So it's like, well, we don't, middle, the upper class, whoever, lower class, wouldn't know anything about this sort of thing. And <laughs> of course they did. Yeah, of absolutely. Course of course they did. So they just knew different things and had a different take on things. Yeah. I just really like the idea of the Lords passing, uh, if they'd actually passed the Act, and all these women around England going, Oh, have you heard about this new thing called lesbianism? I think I might give that a try. <laughs> I'll give it a go. Sounds much better than, than going to bed with a man. <laughs> I love this idea that it's a new thing of lesbianism. I just that that just tickles my fancy right there. I just can't stop it's, laughing. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's, um, it's a funny old thing. It's 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 seeing it, it was the beginning of how uh, of the seeds of where we are now, really. Um and, and that's why I think the book is, is, it does have some sort of modern relevance because the other thing that about my character is that she particularly likes to dress up in disguise as did Maud West. So she kind of sees her going undercover as a chance to dress up as a, a, as a male. And she really likes it, you know, it's, um, and that was, that was something like characters like Ratcliffe, um, Ratcliffe Hall and um, Gluck were dressing as, as in masculine ways. And that was seen as some that was actually seen as, as as just a bigger threat as lesbianism, because it was like women were trying to get the same rights as men by dressing as them, you know, and it was like seen as cheating almost. And and people were more horrified by cross dressing than by by anything else really they, they saw that as a massive threat and a massive perversion really and there's don't i've forgotten her name there was a very famous polish woman who was a, a champion skin her name has kind of gotten out of my mind and she completely dressed masculine it's yeah because that's what she wanted it's the way she was and there's a debate, was she a lesbian, was she not? She never married, she had a lot of female friends. And it's it was very interesting, I actually watched a, uh, a talk about it at, at a conference and it was very interesting to see why she did what she did. Well, absolutely. I mean, there have, there have been cases of, of, of women dressing as men to get what they want as, because they just can't access it as a female. I think there was one in America as well, wasn't there? That 
Um, so yes, it's not unheard of, but but in particularly in in um, sort of the soldiers and, and things like that. Yeah, but but I think I think lesbians like Ratcliffe Hall and Gluck were were dressing in a masculine way for a different reason, really. Um, but it was still massively frowned upon. You know, it was they were just regarded as weird and. But that, that's, I mean, that's sort of a development into identity politics as well, because um, historically, homosexuality, particularly between men, was something you did, not something you were. So, so the, the, there are cases of uh, acts of homosexuality by heterosexual males who didn't identify as, didn't see themselves as homosexuals. It's just, so uh, I think that is something that's, changed as well that that because of identity politics you have to it isn't something you do it's something you are that's also very interesting because that if we go back even further a lot further back into ancient greece for example that was normal it was normal to have yeah, totally. for example a rite of passage for a young man to have sex with an older man it was, yeah. it was normal that there was how do we get from something that was normal as i said to something that is frowned upon, all in between of a couple of thousands of years. It's, it's for me, it, it's it's mind blowing. Well, it's been, it, and it was up and down throughout that time as well, and in different places, acceptable in different places, and um, not acceptable in other places. But the other thing that that um, is worth mentioning is Ratcliffe Hall. Yes, she dressed in a masculine style, style, but she identified as a female. She wasn't. She it, in later life she um, she did adopt the name John, um, but she always referred to herself as a female. She supported women's rights, and of course she did debate gender roles, um, what have you. But she she called herself a congenital invert, which is like that is such a term that we would never ever use today. It, it's inversion, an invert. It's it's. It was the term they used at the time. It was coined by, I think, um, Kraft Ebbing uh, in Europe, taken up by Havelock Ellis. I'm just reading a very good book about Havelock Ellis and John Addington called The, the New Life. That's, that's really good. But they believed that it was the masculine soul heaving in a female bosom. You know, it was, so that was the seeds of the, and that was the book, Sexual Inversion by Havelock Ellis was, there was a court case and, and and stuff because it was seen as obscene. So we've come a long way in a hundred years, um, in many ways, and yet there's still some way to go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, the situation's always evolving. And I, I was saying to my kids about how much things have changed since I was growing up in the nineties, but which leads to language and stuff. Because as you were writing the book, do you, did you find it difficult that you'd have characters using language that? and reflecting attitudes that are obviously taboo these days. Um, uh, and absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And Dolly refers to herself, Dolly's a well-educated person. She's a real polymath. And so she refers to, refers to herself as an invert. And you almost feel yourself cringing you know, when you're writing this because you think, oh, I'm gonna hope, you know, but that's the word she would have used. And I don't want to avoid I don't want to uh, apply modern attitudes to an historic situation. So it's a really, really difficult, fine line to tread between being offensive and, and, and hope, you know, re readers must realise this is not my opinion at all. Um, but yeah, I believe you really have to reflect the attitudes of the day. So at the, at the time, we've got sexism, racism, classism, male superiority and of course eugenics and race hygiene and imperialism and they were all accepted as mainstream and factual with characters like Francis Galton, Mary Stopes, Winston Churchill. It was it, eugenics and, and um, was seen as something very mainstream and, and, and perfectly not acceptable but, but the direction that we were going in was to try and improve human stock. I mean, it's just abhorrent now. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so 
they are very hard things to avoid in, in the context of the time because those were the thoughts. So, so yes, that was, that was very difficult. Um, and I, I, was, I really felt keenly that I wanted to use the language of the time and um, but not go over the top with it. You know what do you know what I mean? So yeah. Yeah, sort of striking a fine balance between sort of historical accuracy and what people now would deem offensive. So yeah, just throw it in from time to time, but not go nuts. Yes, yes, yes. And um my dolly is actually the fictional daughter of an eminent, eminent Victorian. And whose whose name is not mentioned in the book. There are some there's some clues there for people who, who know who know these sorts of things. But um, but yes, I don't mention the name of the character uh, just out of interest. See if anyone does identify who she might be. But this this chap didn't have any daughters or sons, so um, it's it's a kind of fictional. But as I don't name him. Um, it's it's uh, it, 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 well. It, that's an area to be explored, to be honest, with future books. If I do, if I, if there are any, yeah. So yes, um, but I really did not want to avoid the issues of the day because I do, I think that's just disingenuous and yeah. But obviously, the views in in it aren't mine. So yes, absolutely. Um, but when write, when you're writing modern fiction or fantasy fiction it's your your sandbox you can do what you want with it but when you're writing in the past there's quite a few other pitfalls as well isn't there yeah of course yes and um yes inaccuracy is <laughs> is one of the biggest of course and the the, the language I, as i said before the language that people use i'm really into words and lovely words and I'll give you some later if you're interested. <laughs> but I check the etymology of every single word I use. And if it, and the book is set in 1908, in just one week in June in 1908. And um, I checked the etymology of every word. And if it was didn't enter the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, until 1910, I didn't use it because I just I wanted it to be that authentic. And there are some words in there um, that I've used that people will think are modern and they will every word will have been checked so so words for expressions like have no truck with i mean that's not one that we use particularly much now but um that's a really old expression so yes yeah, some some of the words will sound very modern but they're not and to me that's that's really important but but you can get you can also get very carried away because when you sit and research, I did so much research for this um, that I thought because originally it started a script, as I said at the beginning, it started a script for my MA, and the tutor said you've really got to stop doing the research and get on with writing it because I just got so interested in all in in it's a sort of a bit of a procrastination tactic as well, isn't it? But um, so I, I I came across all sorts of things that I thought, oh, can I get that in? And you think, well, it's going to look very obvious that I'm just trying to get my research into it. So there was one there was one instance that uh, um, that I'll tell you about where Dolly lives backs on to uh, which I did, I did all the mapping on Booth's Maps, which is a fantastic website. Uh, but her house backs onto Mew and Co's. Horseshoe Brewery on, on Tottenham Court Road. And the first part of the 18th century, the fermentation tank ruptured and there was a, a flood of ale and it was St Giles Rooker at the time. And there was a 15 foot, can you imagine this? 15 foot wave of beer. My and it word. brought, <laughs> it brought <laughs> down buildings and killed eight people. I, I, you know what? I think I might have heard of that. Um... It's incredible. I tried to think, and it was, I think it was about 19, 18, beginning of the uh, 19th century anyway. And I tried to think of a way to include it somehow, but I couldn't. And I thought it's going to look so obvious that I'm trying to get this lovely little fact in. Uh, so I had to leave it out. And likewise for women's public toilets, 
you know, I came across information about that and which I tried to get in, which I did get in because uh, the book opens in a lavatory. And yeah, there was only, only men, only men had public toilets initially and women could only go as far as their bladders would allow, which was known at the time as the urinary leash, which is... <laughs> It's great, and that's yeah, that, that affected women's lives yeah. on a day to day basis because you, you've, you've always got to be in range of a toilet that you can use. Yes, and there are no public toilets, so and and when and they and um, I mean, there's a whole history of, of, of public toilets, and they some of them started in the department stores of Oxford Street and stuff. And and what happened then was once women could go to the lavatory in these places it meant they could browse in these shops so it it, it brought in a whole new way of, of shopping so i just find that sort of thing absolutely fascinating yeah yeah we, we've um we, we we got the term rabbit rabbit holing amongst our group and for the great war group where you, you you're doing one set of research and then you get the oh that's interesting and you go wandering off oh. <laughs> and then come back like six weeks later with that's got nothing to do now i've gone so far away from my original topic and how can oh. i get this in my work <laughs> I've, I've spent i've spent days in rabbit holes because you just get so interested and it's so it's so immediate and quick now you don't have to go to libraries you know you you don't have to go to um physically go anywhere you can just sit for hours exploring all sorts of things. I mean, I, I'm not an historian, so my research, although I, I make sure that the sources are authentic and uh, legitimate, I don't, I don't go to archives or anything like that because that isn't what I'm about. Yeah. Did you find targeted research helpful at all? Um, absolutely, yes. And what I... So what I kind of think about that is that I've always, I have for a long time been interested in social history and history, but you read it and it goes one in one ear and out of the other. Um, and what I found with this is because I was sitting studying it and writing it down and gathering information and, um, and I collated it all in different um, categories like I had a food thing and a clothes thing and a political history thing and a word category so I you know I, 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 on paper um, but nonetheless so because I was writing it down and studying it it stuck and it became meaningful um, and because you're you're doing it for a purpose so I found that very very uh, a very satisfying and re, um, process is is reading is learning for a very specific reason rather than just having a, a, a an interest in something and then not remembering any of it. So I found that I found that a great um, yeah. And, and and the other thing as well is that yes, I read a lot of contemporary fiction that was written at the time, so I can get a feel for how. Their, lang their their sentences were structured because again that's a that's a thing that has really changed in fiction is how some sentences are structured so I really like traditional sentences um, and they can often be very long very verbose which is not seen as the um, done thing these days but I personally like those long sentences that are, that are very grammatically structured. So, but I have to find a middle ground. So I can't, I can't write as if I'm an Edwardian. I have to write with a nod to how they would write, but in an accessible way for the modern reader. Do you know what I mean? So that's, the, that was important to me as well, that, that, that I, I, had, I, I gave a nod to the books that were written at the time. And, um, and I made notes of the sorts of expressions that people used. So I have included those and because they're in context, I'm, I'm assuming people will know what they are. For example, um, I, at one point I used the expression to bant. So do you know what to banting is? 
No, I absolutely no idea. No, well, bunting, um, it's actually still used in South Africa today, this word. Um, it, was, it just meant to diet. So it was named after William Bunting, who um, cut carbs out from his diet and lost a load of weight. But then it became generalised and was just used as a general term for dieting, bunting. So, and that's, uh, and as, as I say, um, it, that expression, the banting diet, is still used in South Africa today. So if you look at a menu, um, it will have the, a banting choice. So, but of course, it's fallen out of disuse here. Um, and other words that like all the go meant all the rage. And, and I came across so many of these expressions and words in books that I couldn't resist putting them in, like poodle faker. There's a man who spends a lot of time with women. And bags of... Hold on, a poodle faker or a poodle maker? A poodle faker. That's I'm awesome. going to use that. A man who spends a lot of time with women. Chris, yeah. you're a poodle faker. I was going to say, that's me. <laughs> And um, I mean, I don't even know what I, I, I don't, I can't remember how it evolved. Bags of mystery that meant sausages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, I suppose and, that makes sense because you don't know what's in a sausage. Yeah, bags of mystery. And they're really funny. I mean, these, these words are too, they're, they're, it's irresistible not to use them. Oh, and half, half rats is part intoxicated. So here's, here's, a few. here's a few. Jim crack, juggins hunting, dew dropper, pumblechook, to spangle, that means to flirt, and the order of the boot. Chris, I mean, are you just, spangling with me? Yeah. I've got, I mean, I've got pages and pages and pages of these words uh, because I've sort of collected them. And, and, and the, other, the other source of information that I found incredibly useful I mean, the standard ones like the British New Newspaper Archive, which is wonderful for, I mean, their adverts just give the words that they, in their adverts are just fantastic. But another book that I found really useful was um, Inquire Within Upon Everything, which they used to bring out every year, I think. So I got hold of a reprint of the 1890 version. And it, it had all sorts of advice in like baths that are too hot can cause immediate insanity. I mean, that was the advice of the day, that you can become immediately insane if you have a hot bath. I mean, that's just... <laughs> Run a bath, not too hot, or you'll end up in an asylum. <laughs> <laughs> it's just fantastic. And, for example, clothes. If, if you just use the words for what the clothes were made of at the time, like turkey twill, crepe de chine, georgette, brocade. I mean, they're just so evocative, aren't they? They're just so evocative. So, um, yeah, I got very drawn into all that. But, but yeah, I mean, you have to not use all these words too much because it does look a bit contrived, I think. But, yeah, great fun. You've commented on this a little bit earlier for the next question. But let's touch on it just a little bit more, is how did lesbians such as Radcliffe Hall identify themselves? They, well, Radcliffe Hall in particular just did identify as a female. Yeah, I mean, she would, she would proudly say that she was a lesbian, but she would not, despite the fact that she liked to um, cross-dress, she wouldn't describe herself as anything other than a female and yes so that's 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 as far as I got with 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 that really by the way my friend has finally texted me the name because I, I was uh, asked well, she was at the talk with me at the same time so it was Bronisława Stasia Polankova and the debate was um she was more than just a lesbian there's a possibility that she was she was a trans right so, she dressed very masculine because that's how she identified herself. So that's, I just wanted to add that little bit of tidbit that I well, wanted to add. I'm not surprised she forgot the name. <laughs> I said, there's many Polish names. It's just, it's just, I forgot her name. She's, she's actually quite an interesting character. So I'm not sure if there's anything about her online, but if there is, I'm just going to go and Google it in a minute and I'll let you all know. All right. Yeah. For our listeners, if you if you want to Google that, try and try and spell that. 
Bronislawa. No, I'm joking. I'm killing. I'm, I'm joking. Quickly moving back to the original subject. Um, so how were how were lesbians sort of portrayed by popular culture of, of the time in the um, Edwardian period? I don't know that they were really. I, I, I think, I think, as I said earlier, I think, I think people didn't know what other people knew, um, and because the, the, the society at the time it was we just a very long spell of Victorianism, um, if that's a word, um, and um, people didn't talk about things openly at all, did they? Um, so it's, it's very hard to gauge that really. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that, one of the things that um, was, was kind of obvious was that because women were economically disadvantaged, often two women did live together and that was no, nobody, nobody played any attention to that whatsoever because it was seen as economic economic necessity so that really played into um into their it was an advantage for them uh, because they could women could live together very openly and be totally acceptable whereas it wasn't the case for men uh two men living together because uh, there was no, there was less economic necessity for that to happen. So the women, women, gay women, really were under the net, really, and, and not, not particularly noticed. And it's only by um, women declaring that they wanted to be noticed as sexual people that they became more visible. Hence, they wanted to make it illegal, <laughs> which is. Amazing, really, isn't it? So, our final question, as we get into the end, slowly. Getting the geography right, easier or more difficult than you think? Again, I, I because I'm interested in geography anyway, um, I really, really wanted to get that right as well. I wanted, I mean, it, it's often said that the, the sense of place and the place that the uh, work of fiction is set becomes a, th uh, a character. Um, and my instinct would have been to set it in Birmingham because that's where it's from, where I'm from. Uh, but she, but because of the connection with the suffragettes, I wanted her in London. So I do know London. I lived in London for a while, and I do know it pretty well. And and Soho, seedier parts of London, but the a, a massive, a massive um, help was Booth's Maps Online, um, which is just. If, if your listeners don't know about Booth's Maps, go immediately and have a look because um, it, it, it's, a, it's free for everyone to use as well. So on the, on the, on the maps, it's got, it's got the sort of housing that's um, all in different shades of colour. So they've got, the, it starts with the lowest classes, which are shaded in black, and they're termed as vicious semi-criminal. And the colours go up seven stages up to wealthy. So, and, and as it is today, you have wealthy people living cheap by jowl by, with poor people. And so, and, but, it, but that map gave me a huge help in making sure that my characters lived in the correct areas for, the, for their economic and social group. So the other thing about the about Booth's maps is there's a slider. So you can slide um, the maps across and end up with a map of today. So you can see how things have changed. And if you love, if you like maps like I do, um, you'll find it fascinating. So you, you know, the main arterial roads are still the same, but this has been knocked down, that's been knocked down, that road was still, was there, that little. So, and, and, and it also shows you where all the buildings are. So. One of my characters has to hurry from Oxford Street down to um, Lambeth. And I was able to say she walked past the Inland Revenue offices. She, you know, she walked past this. She walked, I mean, again, very tempting to that knowledge. And so you have to sort of hang back a bit and not put all that in. But that was, 
it was just wonderful. It was wonderful. And um, but yeah, Rutland Gate features in the book, um, which is um, a square in London. Um, and I, I did go and walk around that to get a better feel for it and look at the plants that are there and see what was what might have been there when I was when my book was set. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and also the names, the, the names of certain places just sound better, like um, the stations. Uh, one of my characters goes to Kettering. The reason she goes to Kettering and not to um, Newbury or wherever um, is that I like the sound of the station St Pancras more than Euston or Paddington. It just sounds, St Pancras sounds, it's more evocative to me than Euston and Paddington. Do you know what I mean? So even the, the, the names of places I chose because they are more evocative. Uh, her office is above Marshall and Snellgrove, which is now, which was later Debenhams, was rebuilt. But Marshall and Snellgrove, I mean, that's just, the words are just lovely, aren't they? I could have chosen John Lewis or Whiteley's, but Marshall and Snellgrove is a much more evocative name. Yeah, it, it really speaks from that age, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So, yeah, and I, I love all that. But so I actually found getting the geography right, not too bad, not too bad. There's so much information out there. And um, the, train, the train ride to Kettering, again, information is is readily available i did ask a friend of a friend to give me some extra information as a rail buff um which was very handy so it just it just means that you can give the story some authenticity genuinely going to be spending my afternoon on booth's map so <laughs> oh you sure you you'll if you like rabbit holes you'll be in one there i'm sure yeah, I'll be looking at uh, Gillingham and Medway how, and how it's changed over the last hundred odd years. <laughs> um, they only do, um, it's only, only London, I'm afraid. I, I can do London. I worked in Lambeth, so yeah. uh, I'm playing with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Annette, it's been really good. It's been really interesting. It's good to, because a lot of people sort of say, oh, you know, historical fiction, but you, you obviously use the same processes that historians do as well, and you've really done your research. So, um, it does sound really interesting. Would you mind um, reminding everyone the title of your book and when it's out? Uh, yes, it's actually available now, but it's, it's, its publication date is July the 28th. I have a launch at Topping in Bath here on the 18th of August, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, and the book is called Dolly Butler's Eight Day Week. And we'll um, we'll try and get it onto our History Hack bookshop as well, so that with every sale, the podcast gets a small slice of money, and you get more money than if it was to go through a popular rainforest named website that I'm not allowed to mention for legal <laughs> name reasons because I don't have any money and they'll sue me. <laughs> you know, that, no, that's fine. I'm, I, I'm, I have got a website, anetkane.co.uk, and there's a link to Topping on there where you can buy it from. And of course, you can order it from your local bookshop as well. So yeah, so that's, uh, there's more information about the book on my website, but yeah. Absolutely, and we, this is a personal comment of, everyone should support their independent booksellers because they're not building rockets or super, super yachts with your money uh, and they need it, so. <laughs> well, we're, we're very lucky with bookshops in Bath, very lucky indeed, so. We've got uh, four good ones, one, one, one's Waterstones, but that's pretty good. But yeah, Mr. B's and um, uh, Moreland Road have got a lovely little bookshop. So we're very, very fortunate in Bath. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thanks very much for coming on. You're very welcome. It's been, I've been, I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. 
We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.